I want to make a few comments about then what is urban life? What is life in cities? What is livable? What is, what is life? Life itself. Um, and given the situation in across the urban world where 20% of urban residents own 80% of urban land, well then we have a situation in which not much about that life is going to be straightforward and not much of that life is going to take place without constant sense of struggle. Uh, I'm going to uh, build my remarks around a kind of story or a joke uh, that a bunch of Indonesian urban planners sent around on New Year's Eve. Uh, the story has nothing to do with urban planning per se, but since it comes from urban planners, I'm going to try to make something out of it. So the story goes, an old Italian lived in New alone in New Jersey. He wanted to plant his annual tomato garden, but it was very difficult work, as the ground was hard. His only son, Nino, who used to help him, was in prison. The old man wrote a letter to his son and described his predicament. Dear Nino, I am feeling pretty sad because it looks like I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year. I'm just getting too old to be digging up a garden plot. I know if you were here, my troubles would be over. I know you would be happy to dig the plot for me, like in the old days. Love, Papa. Now, a few days later, he received a letter from his son. Dear Papa, please don't dig up that garden. That's where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Love, <Nino. laughs> At 4 a.m. the next morning, FBI agents and local police arrived and dug up the entire area without finding any dead bodies. They apologized to the old man and left. That same day, the old man received another letter from his son. Dear Papa, go ahead and plant the tomatoes now. That's the best I could do under the circumstances. Love you, Nina. This, this, story, this story says several things about urban life. First, you can obviously consider Nino's actions as a kind of deception. He puts in motion something that is supposed to dig up the truth about a particular event, an event that is not yet resolved. That is, locating the problem, locating the missing bodies in a crime that Nino seemingly has been imprisoned for. While the problem of the missing bodies in the end remains unresolved, Nino is able to ensure that the garden for his father's tomatoes will have been prepared for planting. Additionally, Nino has claimed to know where bodies, truly missing in the eyes of the authorities, are located. But is this the crime for which Nino has been in prison? In other words, without the evidence of the missing bodies, has Nino indeed gone to jail for this crime? Now, while we don't know for sure, what we do know is that there are then various deceptions at work. Nino has convinced the authorities that he knows the location of the bodies. And though he may actually know the real location of the missing bodies, his ability to get the authorities to take the action they did, digging in the, his papa's backyard, did not rely upon whether he really knew that there were dead bodies and that they were missing. What this tells us is that in all efforts we make to accomplish things, to make something happen, whether it is to affect other people, to set in motion a chain of events, or create the life conditions that we want, is that much of this happens indirectly. We have to go around other people's expectations of what they want from us, what they think we are capable of doing, and what they think we want from them. As soon as we put any initiative into motion, we face misunderstandings, resistance, competition, and sometimes threats. In face of these constraints, we can change our minds, try to adapt what we want, or try to convince others around us. We could compromise, make deals, 
Tell others we will do this and that for them if only they will accommodate all or some of what it is that we want to do. We can make our cooperation with others contingent upon their willingness to ensure that we get a piece of the action. In these games and deals, we tend to prioritize what it is that is really important. In all the things that we want to make happen, we often have to decide how to rank things, fix the value of each thing in terms of its relations to others. Of course, this happens all the time. With limited opportunities, we have to decide upon our own needs or those of our loved ones. Who will get to go to school? Who will get to have extra opportunities? Who will get the bulk of our time, our effort, and resources? Cities are full of things that did happen. Aspirations that reached fruition, lives that created spaces of maneuver, opportunities to accumulate resources and experience. And when you look at the history of how these things all happened, how neighborhoods were built, households got money, individuals got a lot of knowledge about things and people with authority, they often did not get to be that way to get where they are now by going at their goals directly. So often people have to set off to do things with objectives, plans, and working procedures in mind only to find out that they operated in an already crowded field with others trying to put in motion their own plans. Too often they found that if they put all of their eggs into it, if they found that they put all of their eggs into one basket, if they committed themselves too much to one idea, one objective, that they might not lose, that they might not only lose everything, but get so discouraged that they would settle for almost anything, or convince themselves that what others wanted from them is what they, in the end, really wanted for themselves. So to avoid discouragement and capitulation, many urban dwellers did a little bit at a time. In fact, for many, the idea wasn't to come up with a plan or to have an overriding aspiration, but try to do something, anything, and see what happened. See how the waters got stirred, who was paying attention, who got excited or upset, who cared a lot about what they were doing, and who didn't care at all. If one could do a little bit at a time, you could often manage to stay under the radar, not draw too much attention to yourself. Because it was important not to make others jealous or provoke them to go after what you were trying to do, because they either had more friends, power, or money to take it all away from you. On the other hand, urban dwellers often did things, anything, to let others know that they were willing to take some risks, to put themselves on the line, to change their conditions, to work with others. So it didn't much matter then what people put forward as their projects, whether it was to fix up the house, add a few rooms, start a small business, pool some money with others to buy something on the cheap, what was important was to indicate a readiness to move, to get going. The specifics of what you put forward were not the relevant thing here. While residents did indeed often want to get somewhere specific, accomplish something concrete and tangible for themselves and their families, they were often willing to let things happen, to allow themselves to end up in circumstances they never expected and then learn to call those unfamiliar, even strange conditions home, or at least a temporary home. In addition, many realized that the impact of any single initiative could be increased through it becoming an aspect or component in the initiatives of others. Not by virtue of being locked down in contractual relationships or mutual obligations, Rather, it was a way of making whatever you were doing something that could be made use of by others. Collaboration among residents then covers a whole lot of different options. 
sometimes residents would simply pay attention to what each other was doing in order to do something else. At other times, there might be collected discussions among relatives, friends, neighbors, co-workers, or colleagues about how to put different skills or contacts together in order to support what remained largely individual projects. Sometimes neighbors would silently agree not to interfere with each, with each other's efforts. Still, at other times, residents would run smoke screens for each other, pretend that certain conditions, events, or projects were underway when they were not in order to control how much attention outsiders paid to them and to ward off any harmful intrusions. In all of these practices and strategies, more than one thing is going on at once. And often what looks to be the reality of a situation is really something else. People may look like they are cooperating, but in reality they are just acting as if they are doing it in order to win themselves the freedom to do their own thing. Or, on the other hand, people may look like they're running all over each other, stabbing each other in the back, pursuing their own strong-willed aspirations, when in reality, they are implicitly learning from and adjusting to each other, affecting each other without it looking like they are doing so. These so-called deceptions, then, are at the heart of urban life. And as such, we can't take all that much for granted. Things are not what they seem to be. So likewise, many urban neighborhoods look like they are a complete mess, look like they are in this total state of disrepair. But something else is often going on. For behind the mess, may exist complex local economies full of different trades and activities silently working together. Where their ability to work together requires that there be no one with sufficient authority to say that this particular activity or object isn't of value or has to go, has to be cleaned up. In ramshackle and messy environments, people often ask, well, why aren't improvements made? Why are residents do not simply get together and pool their resources to make communities nicer? Piles of materials like bricks and old refrigerators and pieces of wood and old tin roofs and wrecked cars sometimes accumulate for years with apparently little use and that could seemingly be discarded yet they hang on as if exerting some kind of magical power. Of course, communities do work hard at community improvement, but even when they do not, it is not always a matter of a lack of resources or cooperation. Rather, it is a sense of letting histories run their course, of retaining memories of all the ways in which a particular space or deteriorating object or infrastructure has been used. All of this can become important because it lets people know that the neighborhood and all that is within it, its people and objects, are available to be used in many different ways by many different combinations of people. These are environments that not only show the excess of past use, but also lets the outside world know that all their efforts to impose their orders and their ways of doing things and their attempts to straighten things out and get people to behave all proper and nice are not going to work here. Now over time, initiatives, incremental, individual, collaborative, short or long term, have had a substantial impact on the built environment. For example, in some areas of Jakarta, Every street and lane is characterized by mixtures of the old and the new, the single and the multi-story, with all kinds of materials and design styles being put to use. While districts may contain mixtures of residences, single rooms for rent, commercial, storage, recreational spaces, churches and mosques throughout, these mixtures take their own particular forms and emphases, block, by block. 
residents thus come to live in a built environment that allows or constrains particular comings and goings, visibilities and vantage points, soundscapes, inputs and evacuations of raw materials and waste, and public exposure and private containment. In other words, these are city spaces where there are many different ways to get something done. Many different alternatives to accomplish things when the way that you are familiar with or prefer just isn't possible now. Now, people who live and work in these places, they know this. How do they know this? Because the way these places look, full of different ins and outs and different kinds of stuff and different places where you can put your body, all of this reminds them of these possibilities every day. The city authorities and outside powers may come into these places and look for the missing bodies, for all the casualties, the bad influences, the sickness, the immoralities and damages, but instead may only find a hundred varieties of tomatoes. Coming back to the story of Nino and his father, what Nino offered his papa was a kind of gift. By basically telling the authorities that the bodies were buried in his father's backyard, he offered the very means of lending a hand that his imprisonment seemed to make impossible. At the beginning, there just seemed no way that Nino would be able to help his father. The crime, the judges, the jail, all got in the way. What Nino could offer was a confession. A confession that ended up being a lie. The failure to produce the bodies thus guaranteed that Nino's act was going to make things more difficult for him. See, often when someone confesses to knowing something that others have been wanting to find out for a long time, there is an exchange. The prisoner may get some time shaved off from his sentence, or win more favorable treatment, or at least soothe a guilty conscience by having finally confessed. But here, Nino will not get anywhere with his action, except the satisfaction to have helped his father. This is a gift that had to overcome obstacles, and it had to be wrapped up in a confession that hid the fact that what was being offered was not the truth, but a gift. And since the gift was predicated on a lie, it was not going to take Nino anywhere else, neither free him from prison, nor any guilty conscience, if he indeed had one. But it says a lot about gifts, and a lot about the kinds of sensibilities that have been at work in building cities in the so-called Global South for a very long time. Of course, with long histories of colonial rule, cities like Sao Paulo, Karachi, Mexico City, Lagos, Jakarta, Manila, were full of so-called gifts brought by the Dutch, the Spanish, the British, the French, the Portuguese, or the Americans. The gifts of education, religious faith, infrastructure, modern institutions, and so forth. And of course, these apparent gifts were not gifts at all. They were offered at a big price, as a display of power and capacity to show the natives who was more capable, and to justify the theft of land, the theft of people's spirits and resources. <laughs> these were gifts that could never be fully accepted because they entail all kinds of future obligations, obligations that still are at times impossible to pay back. But there were other kinds of gifts, gifts more like Nino's, gifts that entail individuals risking getting into more trouble than they already were, so as to offer help to those whose subsequent efforts they may not have been able to witness directly. Just like Nino, will probably never see the tomatoes growing in his father's garden, but yet imagine them thick and ripe on the vine. Cities were full of such offerings. Residents willing to take risks to try something different, even if they did not believe that this was going to really represent who they were, even though their actions were not going to tell the truth 
about themselves. Neo had the perfect excuse not to be able to lend a hand. He was in prison after all. What could he do? He might have felt guilty, but anyone would have excused him if he were not able to help in this instance. Cities have largely been built by people who have gone out of their way to offer things, their experience, their money, and time for projects of uncertain returns. In our work in Jakarta, looking at the history of neighborhoods in the urban core, residents repeatedly tell stories about simple housewives that became activists, businessmen who hired all the hardened criminals, car mechanics who fixed broken water pipes at no cost, police who turned their posts into school for kids who could not afford the regular ones. There are hundreds of stories about people saying one thing so as to accomplish another, of people appearing to follow the rules in order to bend them, of looking like they were cold-hearted people in order to better care for those who were vulnerable. Now, of course, cities are full of parasites, full of vampires. It's full of the elite trampling every aspiration of those who have little, of people stopping at nothing to get their own way. Cities have often been places of imposition, the imposition of particular agendas and ways of doing things, and practices of, of imposing become generalized. It's quite common in Jakarta that fire departments demand cash payments at a scene of a burning building before they will put a fire out. There's the contamination of water basins by polluting industries. The examples are endless. Imposition is a process of not taking into consideration, and thus a refusal of a relationship a refusal of a relationship with the city. A gift, then, is an action that makes a relationship with something where otherwise there might not be any basis for doing so. Just like Nino, who did not have an obvious basis to help with his father's tomatoes, a critical dimension of urban life has been the capacity of people to make relationships with things, events, and people that on the surface do not seem to have any obvious connection, that don't seem to belong. In mixed neighborhoods of Jakarta, while the have and have-nots may not dine with each other every evening, they still manage to make relationships with each other even if there is no obvious basis for doing so. In other words, People will go out of their way to offer advice or a hand even if they are not eligible to do so. In other words, even if they do not have the background or official training to get involved in someone else's life. In fact, the willingness of people to act even when they are not eligible, even when they do not have the authority, the education, social and personal background, has been key to the ability of residents to forge relationships with each other. Thus, through these relationships, they create opportunities for work, for better livelihoods, for spaces of freedom that would not have been possible without those relationships. For if people only have something to say, or only will act when they feel eligible to do so, then few people will take risks, people will remain in their corners, in their narrow worlds, and few new experiences will be created, and no tomatoes will be planted. This does not mean that everything that takes place has to be seen as relevant for everyone. It doesn't mean that people have to set about making relationships between everything. For conversely, to see, see or feel connectedness and relevance to all that takes place within a city would be debilitating of the plurality of initiatives required for the city to function. People have to feel free to offer what they offer, to try out what they try out. Without certain impositions, there would be nothing for others to respond to or align with. But what Nino's gift suggests is that efforts to make relationships when they seem impossible can go a long way in getting things done. And in order to make those relationships happen, you often have to resort to a kind of ruse. 
That is, you have to pretend to know the answers that others want. You have to know where the bodies are buried, even if you have no idea. In order to set in motion the actions that will make the relationship happen. For even Nino knew that he couldn't do it alone. He would have to get others involved in any way that he could. The story of Nino and his father also raises a point about a different kind of gift than the one that we may be accustomed to. When I give a gift, when I, when I give my children something for their birthday, for example, I select an object or experience directly for them, something for their possession. But there are gifts that happen seemingly by accident and which do not appear to the larger world as a gift. Although Nino concocted his story about the missing bodies in order to get the police to take action, that being behind bars prevented him from doing so, neither he nor his father could then announce to the world that yes, Nino had given the father the wonderful gift of digging up the backyard in order to prepare the tomato garden. Such an announcement might create more problems for both Nino and his father than the problem of getting the backyard ready for the tomatoes. This is a gift that cannot look like a gift. This is a gift that the father cannot now claim as his property. If he is now able to plant the tomatoes and then give them to his friends and family, he cannot tell everyone that this is thanks to the gift that he received from his son, a gift that now belongs to him. Thus the tomatoes are officially the result of an accidental occurrence, something that should not have otherwise happened. So many gifts, many opportunities to do things in cities, to have a place, to have certain experiences, cannot really be claimed as the property of the recipient. After all, in order for an object, such as a piece of land or house, to become a piece of property, it has to be recognized as such by others, or registered with some authority, in order to become something which the recipient can do anything with, that can do with in any way that they want. Now, in big global meetings on urban issues during the past several decades, one hears over and over and over that cities belong to their inhabitants. This worthy phrase was intended to promote greater inclusiveness for citizens in urban planning and governance. It is meant to remind us that the city just doesn't work and is not sustainable if its resources, spaces, and opportunities are dominated by the few, and that there are no urban futures without the participation of a city's inhabitants. But if the city belongs to its inhabitants, then who does it belong to? And what does it mean for a city to belong to anyone? How long should someone be in a city before they are considered inhabitants? And how do we know who actually lives in the city? Does an inhabitant have to have a formal dwelling? Do they have to have work? Do they have to sleep inside the city boundaries? Do they have to be of a certain age? How do we count what really counts? Now while governing cities requires a lot of knowledge about the numbers and features of the population to be governed, while it needs some sense of order, of who can legitimately do what where, of who has the authority to occupy specific and spaces and jobs, Cities work largely by avoiding such kinds of counts. In other words, the ability of citizens to learn from each other, to work together, to pool their knowledge and experiences, to bring together different skills and points of view in order to produce new ways of doing things has often been the result of accidental <coughs> gifts where people come together, discover each other, not because they had to, not because they were fulfilling their responsibilities as citizens, but because the opportunity arose in the midst of people doing other things, dealing with a broken water pipe, strolling leisurely in the streets at night, celebrating a religious festivity that brought together different crowds, gathering around a traveling food cart in a neighborhood, or having a heated yet friendly discussion on public transportation. 
the places and opportunities here are not the property of anyone in particular. They do not belong to anyone specific. No claims are being made about ownership. Like Mino's gift, they came about not because someone went out directly and announced to all the world that they were going to dig up a back garden in order to plant tomatoes. They had to work their way through something else. And so cities have to have plenty of spaces and opportunities for these accidents to happen. For people to run into each other, watch each other, enjoy each other. 